Welcome. God bless you. It is good to be with you. I'd like to do a special message for the beginning of our new year. Last week I did one on the incarnation. Just taking a little break in our short series on trusting God. And this is part of my life's message and it is shared bits and pieces throughout most of my ministry and I just thought well I'll and if you've heard some of these things before, it's good to hear them again. A good preacher always reminds himself and reminds others of things they already know. And so I'd just like to share this. It is personal. It's just, this has been such a great help to me in my journey of faith. And I think it'll be of some value to you as well. It began in 1979. September 8, 1978, I committed my life to Christ. That was 45 years ago. Joyce and I celebrated that date this year. It's the first time we <clears throat> celebrated that date. How different our lives might be today, would be today, had I not had a time where I just committed my life to Christ and God honored it. I don't know how to say that. Um, well, in 1979, I heard a message. Most of the things in my life that have had significant influence and given me direction have been from a sermon I've heard. Some preacher preaching like I'm preaching right now. <clears throat> and I would do something with it. Well, I heard a sermon and said, and in the message, the preacher said, you ought to read your Bible. And I thought, I've heard that most of my life. But I had never really read my Bible. Well, bits and pieces and a moment here and a moment there. And then years without any reading. Uh, as I grew up as a kid, I had dyslexia in school, so I didn't know how to read and couldn't read and uh, so it was always reading was always something <clears throat> kind of a threat to me and I just withdrew from that um, but anyway in 1979 when I heard that by that time I did know how to read I, uh, I took a speed reading course and God organized things in my mind and I could read and but I still was not a good reader well, I set a goal in 1979 after hearing this man say, you ought to read your Bible, and I said, I'm going to do that. So I set a goal. That is part and parcel of our, of our Christian faith. It's the doing part. I'm going to do something with what I've heard. Let me give you just a few verses to cement that truth that we're already, most of us are aware of. There is some doing in our Christianity. Joshua 1.8 says this, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10 says, Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. James 1.22, one most of us are familiar with, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own self. If I think I can just be an institutional kind of learner and just hear things and nod my head to them and do nothing with them, I've deceived myself. I'm only kidding myself. Jesus said in Luke 6:46, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? And then he goes on to explain with a parable about a man who heard it and did something with what he heard and how his house stood when the storms came. And the man who heard but didn't do, his house didn't stand. And so you'll see those teachings throughout. The word do is used over 1,300 times in the Bible. And yet Christianity is more than just a bunch of things we do. But there's a place for doing something with what we hear. Well, I began, that was the first, not even knowing what I was doing when I said in 1970s, Nine, I'm going to start doing it. I'm going to read my Bible. In my mind, I thought, I'll read it through one time and get that done, you know, and move on to other things. Little did I know what that commitment was going to do in my life. For a number of years, I did a, a camp during this time of the year, and the camp was called Resolution, Making New Year's Resolutions. And uh, most of us are hesitant, or even there's some negative connotations to New Year's resolutions. I'm going to lose so much weight, or I'm going to begin to do this, is because we always fail at them. But that's the one reason we're hesitant to make the commitments or set goals is, once you do, you set yourself up for failure. 
failure is as much of part and parcel of the Christian life as success is. But if we shoot at nothing, we'll hit it every year. There's an old adage that says this, if you always think what you've always thought, you'll always do what you've always done. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always be who you've always been. In other words, you'll just grow old and never grow up. The changes that you desire in your life, things that are in your life that need to go, and things that are not in your life that would enhance your walk with God, that need to come, they, don't, they just don't happen in our sleep. In our sleep. So if I want to grow in the grace and knowledge, and I want to have some changes made in my life, I need to have some goals. I would like to challenge us all to choose one goal for one year. Another old adage is this, we overestimate what we can do in a day, but we underestimate what we can do in a year. So this isn't just a one day goal, we live life one day at a time, but a year as we have just seen passes so quickly, it is going to be 2024 in a heartbeat. Tomorrow, a new year begins, and I would challenge you and encourage you, choose one goal for this next year, and stay with it for a year, and ups and downs, success, failure, victory, defeat, it's part and parcel of this thing, but to shoot at nothing, I'll be no different at the end of this year than I am right now, which I don't want to just walk in place, I'm going to walk with the Lord, who leads me in a way that changes me and conforms me more to the image of Christ. Well, you need to have purpose behind your, your goals. Daniel 1.8, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's food, the king's wife. says he purposed. He already had made the decision, I'm not going to do this. Now, how that was going to work out, David said it this way. In Psalms 57.7, he said, my heart is fixed, which means I am firmly determined that I will sing and I will praise the Lord. That would be a great goal for the year. I'm going to sing more to the Lord, just in times of privacy, and I am going to praise Him. I will praise Thee, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. It's an act of our will, a conscious choice. It's, it's something I'm going to do. God is not made better when I sing to Him or when I praise Him. I'm the one who experiences the benefits of those doing kinds of things. Then, is what happened when you and I set a goal, we're going to need help. <laughs> Let me give you just a few verses. This is where our Christianity becomes relational. We set a goal, purpose in our heart, and then we say, God, I can't do this. I need help. Isaiah 41.10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I find myself saying to God, I am not doing so good, please help me. And God says, I'm desirous to help you, I long to help you. Psalms 121.2, my help comes, the psalmist says, my help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I mean, you have access to the God who says, I can help you with this. In Mark 9.24, Lord, I believe, the man said when Jesus said, when they gave him the news, his son was dead. He said, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. And Jesus said, let's go. And you know the rest of that account. Hebrews 4, 16, let us come boldly to the throne of grace who obtain mercy to find grace to help in time of need. That's where our faith literally becomes relational. We can know God personally. We're not living off someone else's experiences, somebody else's walk. We establish one, develop one, of our own. Setting goals is a part of that. It has been a, a significant part of that. Well, is what I would encourage you to do is to pray about. Say, God, what, what do I need to do? What are some things that I need to do in my Christian life that I'm not doing? Okay, Maybe it's reading your Bible. In 1979, that was my goal. I, I'd heard that most of my life. You ought to read your Bible, but I didn't do it. And I started to do it. In 1979, let me read the, the last four years of, my, our, of our goals since we've retired from itinerant preaching. In 2020, we set the goal as we wanted to, to be settled. Joyce and I now are setting corporate goals. Many times they're the same goal. 
and to be settled. That's 1 Peter 5.10. To know God, Philippians 3.10. And to conquer me, that was the one big one for me, to conquer me, James 4.10. Um, I've had more problems with me than any man I know. That's a quote from D.L. Moody. To conquer me, to learn to say no, to deny myself, those kinds of things. I'm still working on that one. <laughs> In 2021, to hold fast and hold forth, excuse me, to hold fast and to hold forth the word of life. Philippians 2.16, Psalm 61. To be somebody that's not going to compromise when the word, when the word of God has always been taken shots at, whether it's divinely inspired, whether it's really God's word, whether it really has the authority. Oh yes, I can't compromise at all on that. They'll did well in that, shoring up my confidence that the Bible is, in fact, the Word of God. In 2022, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians 7.1, Psalms 40, Isaiah 44.3. Psalm 7.1 says, having these, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 7.1 says, having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You don't manufacture holiness. You perfect that which is your already your identity in Christ. He presents us wholly unblameable. Now bring my behavior in line with that identity. This last year, to develop Christ-like character, to have a heart that would hear and obey the Holy Spirit's voice. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. To sense God leading me and to test it. Is this of the Spirit of God? These, every year, and now since 1979, I have chosen a goal one goal a year, not two, not three. You choose, start choosing three and four, I'll guarantee you you'll do none of them. Choose one, and you may accomplish that one. And I write them down. I would encourage you to do that. Just This is from 1979 to 2023. And every year, every decade, I have all ten goals every year, just one a year. And sometimes you succeed, sometimes you fail. And I want to take us to the 1979, to read my Bible daily. <laughs> I can remember the first week after I made that goal. I started in Genesis, didn't know where else to start. I started right in, the, right in the beginning. And I'd read two, three chapters, and oh man, that first week, it went so good. The second week, I missed a couple of days. And the third week, I didn't read it one time. <laughs> so my fired up purpose, fixed in my heart, I'm going to do this. It lasted about a week and a half, and I didn't do so good. And then the Holy Spirit reminded me. When I was just back into my reading, non-reading mentality, I said, I thought you were going to read. That, oh, I was reminded. See, the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance things you commit, things you say. And I said, oh, yeah. So I got started at it again. And, I, and pretty soon, I'm reading maybe three days a week, four days. And the Holy Spirit is prompting me. I remember one time laying down in bed. And usually I go to bed, I'm not there very long, and I'm going to sleep. And the Holy Spirit said, once I laid down, because I'm always living in fast lane, trying to accomplish more in a day than is reasonable. And the Holy Spirit said, did you read today, Thomas? Oh, I'll read twice tomorrow. I tried to negotiate. And the Holy Spirit says, okay, you know, that's all right. And I thought, no. I need to develop a good habit. I need to establish something in my life that I know will benefit me that I need to do. <clears throat> so I got out of bed and I read 12 verses because 12 is my lucky number. I remember <clears throat> choosing that to do. And I got back in bed and many times after reading, I couldn't tell you two minutes later what I just read. That wasn't the purpose. I was wanting to read the Bible and get into the habit of it because I heard a man preach a sermon this will do you good in your Christian life. And it was, a, it was around the beginning of the year, so he was encouraging people, read your Bible through this year. Well, I'll really shrink this up in this journey. It took me a year and a half to read my Bible through for the first time, and I remember thinking, and by that time, I was in the habit. I mean, I was enjoying the New Testament. And I read Revelation, didn't understand any of it, and still a lot of it I don't quite fully comprehend. But... I'm on my 67th time now of reading the Bible through. Who would have ever dreamed when I made that one commitment 
1979, how that was going to affect the course of my life. I'm going to just encourage you, shoot at something. Just one thing. The next year I heard a message on, you ought to memorize scripture. 1980. And I, I was so moved after hearing this guy preach on this, I said, I'm going to do this. See, the doing part. He purposed to do. He fixed a determination. Say, I'm going to do this. This will be good for me. God isn't going to be made any better. When you're in perfection, you don't enhance anything about God. But God says, these are good things for you to do. Hide God's word in your heart. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you. and you, The scriptures are just so clear. You ought to get, you ought to memorize. You, you get the word of God in you. Something's got to come out. Because there's only so much room in you. And when the Word of God, which is living and powerful, comes in you, some stuff starts to leave that you don't want there anyway. <clears throat> so I said, I'm going to do this. One verse is what it boiled down to, to do one verse a week. I couldn't memorize a verse to save my neck. I remember working on a short one one time and asking Joyce, Honey, see if I can say this. I couldn't remember the first word. I struggled so much with that. Little did I know that someday I'd be able to quote books, large portions of scripture which enhance preaching you want to tell a preacher you want to improve your preaching hide the word of God in your heart memorize scripture and the Holy Spirit will bring them right into sermons they won't even be in your notes but as you're preaching the Holy Spirit will give you oh the game changing that that is done in my own life and ministry I wasn't called to preach yet I had no idea there would be a preacher memorizing 1981 Heard a sermon on prayer. And I remember thinking, oh yeah, we're supposed to pray too. <laughs> Basically, my prayer life consisted of I'm in a jam or before a meal. Okay, I, I'm in a, I've got a problem, then I pray. I had no prayer life. I read a book. I read books that year by Ian e. Bounds on prayer. Andrew Murray on prayer. Attended a seminar on prayer. You can do all those things and still not pray. I did them. And I just wanted to pray for 30 minutes a day. I built a prayer room in my basement. I mean, number of things, but I, I still did not pray. So you know what I wrote down after 1981, pray 30 minutes a day? Failed miserably. It's part of it. I just, I didn't have any prayer life. 1982, study my Bible weekly. So one day a week, I want to study something in the Word of God. I don't know what. I remember studying the virgin birth at first is what I was doing in my Christian faith with reading my Bible now, starting to memorize scripture a little bit, and then trying to pray knowing I needed to. I was walking along like this in my Christian journey. When I began to study one day a week, and then the Holy Spirit would reveal some understanding that I had not known before, I took a full step. 1982 was a game changer for me. I had no idea I would be called to preach. No idea that I would spend hours in studying the scriptures. But it began with a small commitment. I want to study something. The Bible says study to show yourself approved unto God. If you only live off of what you get on Sunday morning sermons, you're going to be spiritually anemic. You need to read, study, memory, and make God the things he encourages us to do to do for our benefit in our own Christian faith. Well, 1983, goal was to love people. I realized I didn't. I was learning to love God. But he said the second commandment is like unto the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. I was a cop and I kind of cauterized my emotions and compassion for people. Get the facts, do the job. And God really spoke to me about this. So you need to love people. Um, that year I was called to preach, October 31st of 1983. 1984, trust God. I'm going to resign my job. We are going to resign. Four children at home. And we're wondering, what are we going to do? God, I, I know you've called me to preach. I, I believe you have. Never questioned, never doubted, never regretted it. But how does this work out? How does this flesh out? And he says, trust me. That series on trusting God. You do what I ask you to do, and trust me, and I will take care of you. 1985, I'm pastoring a small church. Um, 
I realized my weakest message was the gospel. <laughs> I know that even sounds funny for me to say that. I love to preach the gospel. Now I gotta, it's what happened in 1985. Get a grip on the gospel. I memorized 25 gospel verses. In the little church I was pastoring, I said the first Sunday every month, invite people to come with you that don't know the Lord because I will preach the gospel. I'm going to preach the gospel the first Sunday of every month and you bring your friends with you. You know what happened in 1985? The gospel got a grip on me. It's never let me go. A game changer? Yeah. One simple goal. Do you understand? There's many believers, truly born again believers, that do not have a grip on the gospel or a I've allowed the gospel to have a grip on them. They struggle with assurance and so many different things because they don't understand the gospel. A good goal, just, God, I want to understand. I want to get a grip on this. What do I really believe? What does the Word of God really say about the gospel? 1986, I wanted to keep a daily journal. By this time now, I'm reading biographies, and most all of the great men and women of God journaled. They wrote down, they, they, and some of their journey of faith, their successes and their failures. So I began to journal and did journal for 11 years. <clears throat> then I, I got away from journaling and I've been journaling now the last probably 10 years again. Just write down some thoughts because if you don't, you forget what God's doing in your life. So in 1987, I realized I still don't have a prayer life. I'm pastoring a church. I still don't know how to pray. So I made the goal, God, I want to become a man of prayer. I failed. The end of 1987, I didn't pray any more than I did in 1981 when I made that first commitment to pray. So in 1988, I made the same goal again. I said, God, I know I need to learn to pray. Uh, the book I've written on, Lord, teach us to pray. That's the disciples. They knew how to pray. They just didn't do it. Prayer's a doing thing. It's something we do, something we put a priority on, and we come before God. And we say, I need help, and we learn to pray in the Spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. We learn the endurance of prayer. But I didn't know those things then. 1988, I made that same commitment again. 1988 was the toughest year of my life. I wouldn't want to repeat 1988 for all the tea in China. But what 1988 did was season me for the next 35 years or 40 years of ministry. You don't develop endurance in ticker tape parades when everything's going your way. It's when things are hard, when things are difficult. And that was the hard, I was defeated, discouraged, depressed, disoriented. I was a mess in 1980, pastoring a church and everything on the outside looking pretty good. And that was the year I resigned from that, not having a clue what I was going to do, knowing only that God has called me to preach. And the uh, itinerant ministry developed. The relationship, and I haven't got the time at this tape to tell you how that occurred as God began to lead us and to trust him. He said, I've called you to preach, not to pastor. I didn't think there was a difference. There is. And so preaching is what God wanted me to do. And we have traveled all over. <laughs> and 35 years of itinerant preaching have passed. Now, closing in on 40 years of that. Well, in 1989... I read a book by Watchman Nee called Walk in the Spirit, Game Changer. Um, itinerant ministry began, and a relationship between God and I was now, had a decade under its belt, from 1979 to 1989. And there's no question about it. I was a different man because of one goal a year. Well, I want to close with this. This message is meant to encourage you. Every long journey begins with a first step. Take the first one. Set one goal once a year. Philippians 3, 13 says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press on toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 9, 23 says this, and this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Know you not that they who run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. Our Christian life is not a sprint. You don't need to hurry toward the finish. It's coming fast enough. 
I've been in a hurry most of my life, only to find out life's going by fast enough without me hurrying it. Run the Christian life like a marathon, not a sprint. Let me give you this verse, and then I'll pray. Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience. Pace yourself. One goal for one year. You may succeed, you may fail, but if you shoot at nothing, you'll hit it. Shoot at something, you may hit it. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. Pray you have a great new year.